Infrastructure can be so many different things from the roads, railroads, the buildings, the streets. When we talk about sustainable infrastructure, what we're talking about is really trying to meet the needs of society today without impacting the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. From a climate change perspective, from an overall sustainability perspective, probably the best new building is an old building that's not torn down. We're looking at how do you improve their performance? How do you improve their longevity over time? When we talk about sustainable infrastructure at HCAD and at our centers, we've taken an approach that we're calling opportunistic retrofitting. One of the projects that we're working on is called Reside Right. Over a million siding jobs are done every year in the United States. So we wanted to look at a way to optimize that work to make the house more energy efficient while it was being resided anyway. We did this on 10 homes around Newark, New Jersey and different towns. And we ran an energy model on the existing conditions of the house. So in the image on the left, we took an infrared image of the house before we did the siding. We're losing heat through the framing. In the image on the right, you can't see the framing anymore because we've wrapped that house in a nice warm blanket of rigid insulation. Even though it seems like residing one house or 10 houses, it's a drop in the bucket. The fact that over a million houses a year are resided in the United States shows us that there's massive potential for this to improve the efficiency of the majority of housing stock in the United States. And what we're working on now on that project in particular is the training component. So we're using our digital design students to help us create this online training with animations and with augmented video, and that's worked out really nice. It's been a good collaboration as well. The research focus of the Center of Natural Resources is to implement engineering solutions in a way that maximizes the resilience of ecosystems. The most salient problem for many of these communities in New Jersey is stormwater flooding. There are there's something called green infrastructures. For the last few years, we have been focusing on the core benefits of these green infrastructures. We are investigating the problem using physical models. Another problem is water quality in their watersheds. There could be a lot of agriculture runoff. There could be a lot of sediments going into a lake and really damaging these lakes. Our goal is to bring to the communities turnkey solutions, something that they could immediately take from us and then implement it. One of the tools we, we develop is an index for resilience. We call it a community intrinsic resilience index. We took the sectors that impact resilience, energy, transportation, public health and socioeconomic, and we are combining these to, at the end, give the community just an index to say this is the resilience of this particular community. The MATS lab is the materials and structures lab, and our research mostly focuses on, um, on understanding uh, new materials and existing materials within civil infrastructure. The production of, of concrete and, and cement roughly contributes to about 8% of global carbon dioxide emissions per year. We're looking to limit the amount of CO2 that is embodied within concrete materials uh, so that we can limit the amount of carbon that's going into the atmosphere. One of the materials that we study is something in layman's terms you would call bendable concrete. If you apply sort of small fibers that maybe are the thickness of your hair, when concrete wants to bend, those fibers pick up the load and so those cracks don't develop. One of the most important areas that we're working on is uh, the ability of concrete structural systems to withstand earthquakes. And so uh, in doing that, um, we're looking at new concrete materials with these fibers that uh, ultimately reduce the, the risk of collapse from the, the biggest earthquake that you can imagine. So in this test, we actually measure the strength of the concrete by squeezing it until it breaks. Uh, this type of test is something we do a lot in our, in our laboratory and our students do most of this testing so that they can get hands-on experience and learn about the materials uh, in the laboratory. Sustainability is really what happens at the intersection of societal needs, economic needs, 
uh, and environmental needs. And in that sweet spot in the middle, that's where you really have sustainable practices. One thing that I realized is once you go to the scale of atoms and molecules, the distinction between what is alive and what is not alive is very, very blurry. So for me, the step from smart materials to bio-enabled systems was a natural progression. One of the studies that I'm currently working on is a green wall system. What the green walls can do is help us conserve um, energy that would be otherwise used for heating or cooling buildings. So this is looking at temperature measurements in behind different facade panels. And you can see that the black panel, in behind the black panel actually, reached top temperatures of almost 52 degrees Celsius, whereas the clover or the grass were staying around a comfortable 28 to 30 degrees Celsius on a hot summer day. For me, it is incredibly important to be at NGIT where I can collaborate across all these different disciplines because any invention, any new findings that, that need to be applied, they have to come out of these collaborations in between biologists, physicists, engineers, and the designers, of course. We will have to house billions of people more that are popping up on the planet, and we have to do that in the most sustainable way possible. We cannot deplete more resources, so we have to use the resources that we have a lot smarter.